Hey everybody, it's Mr. Hefner again. And today we are going to get started in our American uh, Literature, uh, American Revolution unit with the first of our authors, and that's going to be Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite uh, founding fathers. Benjamin Franklin it was an ordinary, everyday American until he made himself be something special. He's the very example of the American dream, the idea that you can be anybody, anything you want to be if you work hard enough. And for many, many years, 250 approximately, he has been the icon of that dream. In fact, I'm coming you, to you today from, uh, thanks to, uh, oops, over here, I always get that backwards, over here from, everything's backwards for me. Uh, there we go. No, I can't quite do it. There we go. Alaska Airlines, yes. And uh, they brought us here to the New York uh, Public Library. The libraries in America are one of Ben Franklin's gifts to America. One of the things uh, he wanted to do was read more books, but he couldn't afford more books. He had his own collection. And then he realized, if I can get my collection of books and put them with a friend's collection of books, we could each read one another's books. What if we got every middle class person in our community who had books to contribute them to one library that we could all share from? And he called this a, a subscription library. Today we have free public libraries where uh, donations and taxes pay for the library. But in his day, it was a subscription. You had to give books to the library in order to be able to borrow from the library, or you paid a fee. And if you paid money to be able to buy books, you could then share in the books with others. But it led to our creation of, of libraries here in America. And the New York Public Library, like the one I'm standing in right now, is a fine example of that. So let's get started right now with Benjamin Franklin. All right, so this is called from, remember we said when you see this word from, it means we're just reading an excerpt from the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. The autobiography is actually very short. It's unfinished. Benjamin Franklin started writing it and then he stopped to work on other things like, oh, the American Revolution, the uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the, uh, the Treaty of Paris. He worked on all of these things. And uh, ultimately, he died before it was finished. And it was first published in French. And it became an absolute bestseller. It's in four parts. Uh, the last part, the fourth part, wasn't actually added until after the American Civil War. So it came much, much later. It's really the first two parts that, that are most interesting and are often quoted from uh, as models of how to be a good person and what to do with your life and become something. It is an autobiography, and you remember again, bio means life, as in biology. To grasp something means to write about it, and auto means self. And so literally this word means self-life writing or writing about oneself. As we talked about in the last unit, there was a time when writing about oneself was considered to be kind of, uh, kind of rude, to be perfectly honest. Benjamin Franklin uh, is one of the first people to write an autobiography and make it popular. But he's pretty cagey in the way he does this. He addresses part one to his son. And he says kind of, you know, son, when I was your age, our dad, my dad, your grandfather, Josiah, uh, used to tell me stories about our family and how he grew up, and I, I enjoyed hearing them. And I know we haven't had much time to do that, so I'm writing them down here for you. And so from the very beginning, he doesn't seem like someone who wants to be remembered in history for his actions. He seems like a father just passing on family stories to his son. By the time he got the, sec the second part of the autobiography, though, he and his son had become estranged from one another. You see, Benjamin Franklin's son, William, stayed a, uh, a Tory during the American Revolutionary War while Ben Franklin was a patriot. They were literally on opposite sides of the war. And at one point, William even told the British troops where they could find his father to arrest him. Didn't happen. Ben got away. But that sort of thing puts a, a kink in your relationship, your father and son relationship. So by the time Franklin was ready to start the second part of the book, he no longer had a reason to write to William. But again, he's really smart. At the beginning of part two, he includes two letters from friends. And the nature of the letters is, hey, we read the first part of your autobiography and we found it really fascinating and we would really like you to keep writing. And so Ben just complies and he goes on writing the next part. 
And so we end up with the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Now, the way Ben Franklin writes, we've been talking about these thinkers of the Enlightenment. And Ben Franklin became enamored with this concept of something called neoclassicism. Now, neo means new, but classic kind of means in the style of the ancient Greeks and Romans. And in the, in the days of ancient Greece and Rome, we had a lot of philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. And so by the time the Enlightenment comes along, one of the concepts is anyone can really sit back, look at the world, make observations, identify rules, and then come up with, well, if we do this, then this. And, and it's sort of a, a social science, this neoclassicism. Sit back reflect on the world, and come to deeper understanding. And that's what Ben Franklin does in this autobiography. Just some real quick background stuff. Uh, he was the 10th son. Now notice it says 10th son because there were even some girls. But Josiah Franklin had had uh, two wives over that time period. Uh, so when he remarried, he married a woman who was younger and still had childbearing years to go. When Ben was very young, he was apprenticed to James Franklin in the printing business in Boston. Now, James is the oldest son. Ben is the youngest son. So with all those people in between, you can kind of see that James was almost like a parent uh, to young Ben. And that caused problems because Ben realized they were siblings, not parent-child. And Ben also realized he was probably smarter than his older brother. So those two are going to have a falling out as they try to work together. And that's actually going to be the subject of the excerpt we're going to read today. Ben Franklin leaves Boston, he runs away, and he gets a job with a printer in Philadelphia named Samuel Keimer. But even though Franklin is, again, much younger than Keimer, he's a much smarter businessman than Keimer, and he knows more about running the business. Eventually, Franklin leaves Keimer. He gets a job under the direction of a, a governor of Pennsylvania who says, go off to England, pick out the best penny, pick up a printing equipment, uh, and then I'll send you money, you'll buy it and bring it back, and I'll set you up here in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, when Franklin got to London, uh, nothing else happened, and he was basically stranded there. So he got a job working in the print houses in London, and the London print houses were far more advanced and did much better quality work than American print houses, so that by the time he comes back to America, he has talent in the printing industry that even the, the print shop owners don't have at that time. He starts Pennsylvania's first regular newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, and uh, then he starts writing an almanac. Now, you might know almanacs, but they're, uh, they're full of all kinds of entertainment, witty sayings, predictions. Uh, sometimes they have news. He called it Poor Richard's Almanac because he didn't publish it under, under the name Benjamin Franklin. He published it under the name Richard Saunders. And he actually competed with another almanac in Philadelphia, and uh, he was pretty smart about how he did that. So he took his, his new almanac and, and drove the other one out of business. Uh, early on in his life, Franklin made so much money in the printing industry, he was really smart. Once he knew what he was doing, he essentially created uh, the McDonald's of the printing industry. You know, when, when you drive past the McDonald's, that McDonald's is most likely locally owned. And whoever bought it and owns it learned how to run it from the McDonald's Corporation who charges a fee. Ben Franklin did exactly that. He said, hey, you want to be a printer? I'll buy you the printing equipment. You go to this city, you set up your own newspaper, and you can use the equipment I bought for you. The only catch, you send a percentage of everything you make back to me. So Ben Franklin had really created uh, this big network of printers and all the money, not all the money, but a lot of the money was flowing back to him. So he was really a young man when he decided to retire, and that's when he started working on his, his many science experiments. He was always curious. Uh, he would go back and forth on ships uh, to Europe, and he started taking temperature readings of the Atlantic Ocean and discovered the Gulf Stream while he was doing that. We all know about the flying the kite and things, but he did a lot of experiments with electricity. And, and terms like volt and positive and negative and, and flow, those are all Benjamin Franklin terms for electricity that stuck around till today. Uh, he believed in something he called the, uh, the power of the middling man. Middling was middle class. He believed that the middle class was where it's at, and if you read and, and educated yourself, you could be as good as any man. That's a real Enlightenment uh, philosophy right there. And he formed a group in Philadelphia called the Junto. 
It was other businessmen like himself who wanted to read and, and make themselves and make society better. They would sit around at a local tavern, they would drink, they would sing songs, and they'd come up with great ideas. Uh, they started, for instance, the Philadelphia Academy, and that survives today as the University of Pennsylvania. They came up with the ideas for Philadelphia's first fire companies, and we've already talked about the subscription library. Benjamin Franklin has a host of inventions. I'm not even going to begin to go into those, but he also experimented with things like religion. Uh, he started out, you know, studying in, in one religion, and as time went on, he sort of built his own. And we'll talk about that, you know, as we get deeper into the autobiography. Uh, he believed that people had to work to become good. Uh, and these elements of moral character he called virtues. And he came up with a very scientific way of measuring his own virtues and working every single day to become a better and better person. And obviously, we know he was an incredible diplomat working with the French to secure their support uh, in the American Revolution and then working to negotiate the end of the war with Britain. Now, I mentioned a little bit of this earlier here. Uh, the autobiography is in several parts. The first part is addressed to his son, William, but he couldn't keep writing to William after he separated from him. And so uh, the second part of this was by request. Some of his friends said, please keep writing. Uh, the third part also falls under that same request. It doesn't have additional requests. And then part four, which is really very short, it's just a few pages, uh, focuses on the French and Indian War and uh, how he managed to uh, build an army and, and supply troops and, and things like that. Now, you'll notice part four ends with the French and Indian War. That means there is nothing in here about the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. All of these things happen in Franklin's life, but he was many years behind now as he was writing. So he was always, you know, 30, 40 years behind now. And unfortunately, uh, Benjamin Franklin passed away before he got to that part of his life. It was written over a 20-year period, and it, uh, the book ends 32 years before Franklin actually died. So 32 years of his life are not covered in this at all. The first part is interesting. It was published in 1791. So that's going to be three years after the uh, Constitution. And it was published in French. It was later published in English. But the French absolutely loved it because they were fascinated by this man. Um, and then uh, I've mentioned this before, it's a neoclassical style. Joseph, Joseph Addison, you might remember, was one of those thinkers of the Enlightenment that we studied. And he was one of the ones that, that Franklin read carefully. So when Franklin writes, he writes in the style of Addison, of sitting back, observing, reflecting, and proposing. Okay, observe, okay, just watch, think about it, and then come up with an idea based on, on what you've observed and thought about. All right, we talked about autobiography, so I'm going to skip that. And, and the only thing you need for style is that this was written in the style of neoclassicism. All right, we'll talk about that as we go through the piece. As you read, I want you to look for Benjamin Franklin's relationship with his brother James. As I said, it was contentious, but James was much older. Ben was much younger, but Ben probably was smarter. And uh, James didn't handle that very well. James often uh, became physical in his abuse of Ben. Uh, look for the idea of egotism again. The idea of not, of not of being narcissistic, but the idea of writing about the self, being inside your head, thinking about what things you do mean and how you can become a better person. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you, obviously, how was Franklin influenced by the Enlightenment? This book probably would have never been written had Franklin not written and uh, not read Enlightenment thinkers. Um, and then about this, too, because sometimes even when we do the right thing, we wish later on we had done it in a different way. And so Franklin is going to break his indentured servitude to his older brother, James. Uh, and then years later, uh, he's going to think back on that. And I want you to look for how he feels years later. All right. Go read the piece and then come back and we'll take a quick look at these right here. Now, I'm going to pick up a different pen here so I can write on here. We'll, we'll take the, the pen instead of that. But we're going to go over these right now then. You can pause the video if you're, uh, if you're watching this uh, online. Franklin's autobiography suggests that newspapers became a successful venture uh, in America 
And absolutely, that is true. What he says at the beginning of his autobiography is people told him Boston already has one newspaper. It doesn't need another. And by the time he was writing his autobiography, there were newspapers all over the colonies. How about number two? Young Ben Franklin submitted articles anonymously to James Franklin's newspaper because he wanted to share his views of King George with other colonists. This is a complicated uh, true or false here. It is true, of course, that Benjamin Franklin wrote pieces for his brother's newspaper. He slipped them under the door at night. He signed them Silence Do Good. So he made up that name. He actually wrote uh, taking on the persona of a, a widow with things to say. So that first part is true. But the second part, uh, he was not writing about uh, to King George about the colonies or anything. He wrote about all kinds of topics, including women's rights. So we have to make that one false because the whole thing needs to be true in order for it to be true. How about number three? According to Benjamin, when James Franklin published an article that offended locals, uh, he was sent to jail, mostly likely because he refused to name its author. And that is absolutely true. So in the old days, there was this concept called sedition. If you wrote things criticizing the government, you could be brought up on charges. And the crazy part is in those days, if it was true, and it hurt the government, you got punished even worse uh, than if it was made up, because the truth is harder to argue against. Okay, and so in this case, when James goes to prison because he won't reveal the names of the people who wrote it, uh, Ben ends up actually publishing the newspaper in the time when James is away. And so that's kind of the answer to number four. Benjamin Franklin's father managed the paper while James was in jail, and that's false because it was actually Benjamin who did it. And then number five, when Benjamin and James took their disputes to their father, he angered Benjamin by agreeing with James, and that is false. Ben tells us that most of the time, dad agreed with the younger of the two brothers, maybe because he was right, or maybe, and this is in, you know, from Ben's perspective, maybe because Ben was just the better person at arguing his case. Sometimes you, you can use good rhetoric and, and strategy and win a case even though your facts aren't as good as someone else's. All righty, I'm just going to draw lines for these here, but what is the manner in which something is said or written? And that is going to be style, so we would put style right here. What is the story of a person's life? That's going to be an autobiography, so we're going to put that right here. Uh, three, clarity of thought and expression and a tendency towards generalization and moral instruction are qualities that can identify that would be neoclassicism. All right. Uh, now, neoclassicism is more than that, but that would be a, one example of neoclassicism. Uh, number four, any recurring feature, such as a, a word choice or grammatical structure, can distinguish one, and again, that's still going to be style, one style from a different style. And then a writer's blank may change from work to work, but stay constant throughout his career. And again, that's going to be style. So they've given us style in three of these here today. All right, so that's all we have for our introduction and wrap-up of Benjamin Franklin. Be sure to read the excerpt that is in your textbook, scanned into Schoology for you. And then in this class, we're going to also take some other parts, and we're going to do a jigsaw. We'll put you in groups, and we'll have different groups do different parts of the autobiography, and then we'll share that back with the whole. Again, if you stayed with me till the end, thank you, and I hope you're going to like Benjamin Franklin.